Hi there, I'm JP Dice and welcome in to Beyond the Briefing. We're talking aviation weather like we do frequently on this particular YouTube channel. Excited to be here this week. Uh, we've taken a little hiatus over the last several weeks, had a lot of different presentations going on around the country. I uh, have one this week with the AOPA. It's called uh, Hartzell Seasons of Safety and uh, we're going to be on Thursday evening. That's going to be on the 22nd at uh, 7.30 Eastern, so uh, 6.30 Central. Hope you can join us for that presentation. I was on uh, a couple of weeks ago with All American Aviation out of Texas, and hope folks join me for that one uh, with some FAA Wings credit. Good presentation there. And we're really just concentrating on things to help you be safer when it comes to aviation weather. Still aviation weather related accidents, according to the NTSB, 75% uh, of them are actually fatal. So we're trying to reduce that number. There's some common sense things we can do to stay out of trouble. So we're getting into the fall season here. The cool season will be in winter before you know it. And already starting to talk about some of those cool season issues that we run into. Uh, number one, visibility, low clouds. We start to see a bit more fog this time of the year and low overcast. You start running into those days where it's two, 300 feet overcast. We have severe weather. Actually, as a meteorologist for the last 25 years, I have noticed that we have a good bit, especially in the southeast and midwest, of severe thunderstorms that happen during the fall and winter. Last year, as a matter of fact, I covered more severe weather, including tornadoes, during the winter months than what we actually had during the springtime. So keep that in mind. One of the more common types of severe weather that we run into during the fall and winter is the QLCS, the Quasi-Linear Convective system, otherwise known as a squall line. These uh, big storm systems are lines of storms that are almost impossible to deviate around. They are connected with an approaching cold front. Oftentimes you have high winds, you have very heavy precipitation, you have wind shear, turbulence, and even sometimes tornadoes. Best uh, school of thought there when you are seeing one of those come up on your radar scope, whether it be the data link weather or the real-time radar, is park the plane. Uh, find a good place to land and wait it out because these things are just a bear to deal with. You're not going to really find a hole in there to get through safely. And the only way to get around it is to go above it. And that's going to be limited by the aircraft type that you are flying. Most aircraft, many general aviation aircraft, are not going to be able to top those. You're going to have to be in a, in a jet aircraft to be able to do that. Some of your corporate jets and uh, airline aircraft will be able to get on top. Even then, it may be very well a bumpy ride dealing with those QLCSs. Uh, that's the fancy name, again, for squall lines. One of the new features that uh, came up on ForeFlight that I am pretty excited about, I want to show you this, and I hope you're using this. All right, going to the full screen here, I have planned a little trip uh, from Birmingham up to uh, Des Moines, and it takes us through a little bit of weather. I would probably deviate around that if this were actually a real trip, but I want to show you this for the sake of just explaining some things. Now, one of the things that the folks at ForeFly did, we go over to the profile view, and you can now see not only the obstacles that you used to could see, we still have the things like mountains, terrain, uh, anything like that, towers, where you're going to be running into something, you're also going to be looking at icing. And notice right there, you do have uh, a little ice layer that at that particular altitude, flight level 210, that you would end up running into. So some icing if you manage to stay at that altitude right before you got into the uh, really the top of the descent for the uh, Des Moines area. So the profile view really paints a nice picture. What they're doing, they're getting that data from uh, the uh, NOAA folks, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, to be able to help you better visualize this. So use that tool in addition to some of your traditional tools that you are using when it comes to putting together uh, your flight plans. Make sure you always know what you're looking at, what you're gonna be encountering, and have a plan for that. You know, many of the aircraft we fly have no ice protection whatsoever. And then you have the TKS systems that you'll find on some of the Moonies, and you'll see that on the Cirrus aircraft. Remember, TKS, that's the fluid. Uh, that is the weeping wing. That is a, a finite supply of that fluid that's really used to get you um, 
through a transition zone, not to stay in that icing. Uh, the boots and the heated wings do a better job, but even they have some limitations. You can't have icing so bad that you can overcome uh, that, uh, that kind of uh, de-ice equipment. All right. One of the things I want to talk about, you know, uh, traditionally we, we talk about, well, you're going to have some ice if it's zero Celsius and you are looking at visible moisture out there. Obviously, that's going to be a setup for some icing. Remember, you can also have an error on your temperature probe if you're in a fast enough aircraft. You can actually see that temperature probe reading the temperatures a little bit higher, maybe as much as 10 degrees higher than the actual air temperature. That's that RAM air temperature can have an error with it. So anytime you get within that regime of about 10 degrees um, above freezing, 10 above Celsius, start thinking about uh, ice because it is certainly possible in those uh, kinds of situations. And we always know about the super cool drops. You can have liquid water. That's right, liquid water below freezing. I know, hard to wrap your, your head around. You're saying, what in the world is he talking about? If I put uh, some water in the freezer, uh, it's going to freeze if it's below freezing. Well, because of things dealing with vapor pressure and the laws of physics up there in those clouds, you can have super cool drops. And what's going to happen? It's going to be liquid water. It's going to be inside that cloud, but on your airframe uh, that's metal, it's going to freeze on contact. want to talk about something else here. Let's go ahead and switch over to the other computer. And I'll take this full screen. And back to our favorite, Skew Tees. I plucked this one uh, the other day off of Pivotal Weather. That's one of the uh, websites that we frequently talk about, full of model data. I use it for long range flight planning. Look at the GFS models, and I can start getting an idea of what things are going to be like, you know, maybe about a week out. Then I start bringing it closer in with the HRRR, the high resolution rapid refresh. So we're looking at the Skew Tees. I was super excited to see the folks at the AOPA. They've been talking about this uh, in their magazine recently. Recently. So what about the skew T? Where would we find that ice layer? Uh, well, what you're going to have to find is that uh, isotherm there that is zero, follow that upward, and everything on the left-hand side of that is going to be below freezing. Where we see the dew point temperature and the air temperature meet, we have circled there in blue, and that's going to be uh, a saturated level. That's going to be where there's clouds and below freezing. So that would be really your ice layer in this particular graphic. That begins around uh, 7,000 feet and uh, up there around maybe 10, 11,000 feet before we start to see things separate and you're up into the clearing again. So the skew T is a fantastic tool. I don't know if a lot of pilots use the skew T. Uh, it, it is a very helpful tool. The Weather Service meteorologists, when they're putting together the forecast, they use the SKU-T quite a bit. And it is a very helpful tool uh, to forecast where you're going to have clouds, icing, where you're going to break out of the clouds. I have a lot of uh, instrument students that wonder on a trip, am I going to be IMC the whole time? When am I going to break out and actually be on top of those clouds? Well, with the SKU-T, you can find that. you got several types of SKU-T charts as we have uh, addressed in a previous episode. You have the virtual ones that are driven by model data. If you go to Pivotal Weather, you just find a time and date and you click on that location, it will generate the SKU-T. That is a model-derived SKU-T. Then you have the real-time SKU-Ts. Those actually come from the weather balloon soundings that are uh, from some of the uh, local National Weather Service offices. Here in Birmingham, where I am, we do one at 12Z and another one at 0Z. If it's going to be a bad weather day, an 18Z balloon uh, sounding. Uh, in our state, we also do them in Mobile. Huntsville on occasion does them, but uh, we do them two locations on a daily basis. So those balloon soundings are very, very helpful. In, in determining what the upper level winds are, where we have the freezing layer, and so forth. And the model soundings are incredibly helpful as well. want to go back and revisit something. Had a student hit me up the other day and he said, hey, it's going to be really windy tomorrow. I can't take my trip because the winds are going to be, you know, I just don't feel comfortable with those 20 knot winds. And first thing I did, I said, what are you talking about? 20 knot winds, where are you getting this from? Because the forecast was really, yeah, probably five, 10 knots, no big deal. Uh, anyway, he sends me a screen grab and it was like, it was the MOS data. You know the MOS data that I'm talking about on four flight? If you don't know it, let me, let me pull this up. I wanna show you this. And I'm not an anti-MOS data kind of guy. 
but we've got this, in fact, this is for uh, Ganston, one of our nearby airports here. So you've got the METAR, you got the TAF, and you got the MOS data. There's the MOS data. MOS is that model output statistics, that's raw data. Don't use it for go and no-go decisions, okay? It is just to kind of give you an idea. And it's sometimes kind of handy because it goes out uh, at a longer duration than the TAP does. So you can look out several days with the MOS data. But remember, it's just a computer spitting out stuff. It may or may not be correct. Don't use that to make your go and no-go decisions. The TAF, that is the Terminal Aerodrome Forecast, that is produced by a person, a trained, degreed meteorologist at the National Weather Service with experience and education looking at that data and actually coming up with a forecast. Is it always right? No, it's weather. You know, it's not always right, but it's a lot more reliable than the MOS data. And of course, we all know a METAR is the uh, current data that's coming from the AWOS, ASOS stations around the area, the various airports. So hopefully that is helpful. Just understand that data. Understand the data and the limitations that you have with that data. You still find people that aren't quite sure what they're looking at. And uh, I was just teaching a, a class the other day. I'm teaching folks how to understand and read METARs and the TAFs and all those coded messages. One of the students said, why in the world does it look like this? Well, the reason it looks like that gobbledygook, it's like you're decoding something, is because back in the day, we didn't have a whole lot of bandwidth. If you remember anything about the old data transmission rates, baud rate, right? You had very low baud rates, unlike what we have right now. I, I remember when I was a, a kid and I had a 14.4 modem, I thought I was cruising, and that is incredibly slow by today's standards. But uh, back in those days, you're, you're dealing with baud rates less than 100. So they had to code everything and abbreviate everything so that data could be transmission, uh, trans, uh, transmitted. It's like a, back in the teletype days. And we still have that holdover uh, to a certain degree, but most of the data sources that we have now also give us a plain English display. I know my XM and my airplane does. Uh, it also shows the METAR in the coded form, but it shows the plain English, also for flight and all that. So we have, it, we have it a lot easier now than back in the day, but there's still some holdovers. And when you're taking those FAA tests, you still sometimes have to decode those METARs and TAFs. And they can be a little confusing. Sometimes even I have to go and, like, what in the world does that mean? I haven't seen that in ages. I, I told some students the other day, I said, just remember BR, and they were like, what's BR? And I said, that's, uh, that's mist. And I said, an easy way to remember BR is baby rain. Baby rain for mist. So hopefully uh, that helps you out a little bit. Just remember during this, this cool season, as we start to transition over into that, it's not only icing that we deal with, but it's also uh, the convective weather, the thunderstorms, and uh, also low visibility. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of Beyond the Briefing, our weather uh, webcast here. Really enjoy uh, talking to you, and we want to reduce that aviation uh, accident rate, especially when it comes to weather. We'll see you next time.